So uh, my presentation is really going to give you a little bit of background to who Crest is, um, what we're doing, and some context as to why we might bring some value to your, your lives, both uh, at home and, and at work. A little bit of background to me. So my day job is to uh, run an organisation called uh, Netitude, but I was elected into uh, Crest about three years ago to help it internationalise. Uh, Crest is a not-for-profit organisation, very similar in, in theory to OWASP. So we have uh, a lot of involvement with the buying community, people that provide services in the technical assurance space, and we draw upon uh, volunteers and supporters to, to help champion the cause. Some of my background is, is, has quite close alignment with financial services regulators uh, and large financial organisations, and, and I have a fairly deep technical background uh, in addition to all of that. So, a little bit of background to who Crest is, because I suspect some of you will, will never have heard of us. As I've touched on upon a moment ago, we're a not-for-profit organisation. We were formed in 2006 in the UK. Now, we were formed really because of a need that the UK government had. Uh, GCHQ said that they wanted to go out and deliver penetration testing within central government. And they wanted to have a way of going out and finding good and capable organisations that could do that. So they built a programme called Check. After a number of years, government realised that they probably didn't really want to be running a, a programme for uh, information assurance. And so as a result, they had a conversation with industry and a number of the service providers that were providing penetration testing services said, yeah, we can see some value in this. So actually, uh, they, they came together and they formed Crest. Um, so it was an industry coming together uh, to try and promote and develop uh, and mature the, the technical penetration testing space. We have around about 80 members. Uh, those members are very large uh, and diverse in nature. So KPMG is a member, Dell SecureWorks, TrustWave, IBM, HP, uh, as well as smaller boutiques, uh, sort of 10 and 15 man cybersecurity organisations. And the reality is we, we have something to present to all of those to help them present themselves to, to the market. As I touched on at the beginning, we were initially formed in the UK to service the needs of a specific requirement that existed in the UK market. However, as time has gone by, we've opened up chapters in Australia back in 2012. Earlier this year, we opened up cha chapters in Singapore and in Hong Kong, and, and more recently, we've opened up a chapter in, in New York. So, we started off doing uh, pr providing accreditation and certification services in the realms of penetration testing, and I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But over time, we've evolved that into instant response services uh, and into threat intelligence, and more recently into security operations centres. A lot of us look at the, a lot of people look at Crest and kind of go, well, you, you're the guys that do accreditation and certification, and, and that's in truth we are known for that. But really, that, that isn't the purpose. What we're trying to do is we're trying to help the, the technical assurance industry professionalise. So we, we are trying to help raise capability, capacity, and consistency. So we keep hearing about the fact there are not enough good people in the industry uh, to do all of these types of things uh, from, from a technical assurance perspective. So Crest actively works with uh, higher education uh, institutions to try and bring more people into the industry. Similarly, um, some of you I'm sure will have had experiences where you might have gone out and bought pen testing services or seen testing, pen testing reports that were hugely variable in quality. And I guess what Crest is trying to do is, is try and make them a bit more consistent trying to find a bar of what good looks like and to get people to exceed that bar. Uh, and I guess the other thing is uh, we want to have some form of consist consistency internationally. So if you go out and have some form of assurance activity uh, conducted in New York, that should have some similar threads to if it was conducted in the Middle East or in Europe or, or in Asia. So Crest sees itself as a body that sort of brings government, regulators, buyers and suppliers together to try and Im improve professionalise and mature that technical assurance space. So how do we do that? Well, I guess, fundamentally, we go out and accredit organisations. That means something quite important to us. So accreditation, in our minds, is going out and measuring organisations' capabilities to do things that are important to buyers. If you think about the normal buying cycle from when, when somebody goes out and buys a pen test, the kind of things they say are, show me your sample reports. 
maybe send me some resumes. Uh, tell me a little bit about some of the clients in, in, that you've done work in that are in the same kind of sector. Those kind of questions, they might ask for methodology statements as well, or maybe some information about vulnerabilities you found. And all of that's great, okay? But quite often that information gets presented in a way back to the buyer that isn't actually easy to understand. Guess what? If you're asked to present to somebody your sample report, you don't give the vanilla sample report, you give the one that's got lots and lots of red on it. That isn't necessarily an indication that you're really, really capable. It just means that you did a pen test against an organisation that had a lot of vulnerability. It's not necessarily an indicator of goodness. Similarly, um, having some resumes uh, of, of very good and technical people, that has some value, but what, what kind of technical certs, what technical background should people have if you're doing a pen test? Should that be aligned to mobile or to, to web or to infrastructure? The, the answer, of course, is yes, but sometimes it's difficult for a, a, a buyer to determine what, what does good look like. Similarly, again, um, the kind of things that, that, that the buyers are going to be interested in are uh, methodology. Well, the methodology is potentially very complicated. And so, you know, if I presented you 10 different web app pen testing methodologies, you might find that actually a lot of them are quite similar based upon standards. How do you derive goodness from looking at a load of methodologies that look quite similar? So I guess through the accreditation process, what Crest does is we, we look at what those indicators of good are and we measure organisations against that. So the kind of things that we think are important beyond the things that I've talked about just now are if you're going to go out and do a pen test and you're going to gather some fairly sensitive data about an organisation, you need to have some good controls to protect it. So we want to understand what is your data protection policy. Similarly, if you're going to transmit some reports that have got some, some severe vulnerabilities in them, we want to know how you're going to communicate that to, you, to your clients. We want to understand a little bit about the people you employ, but not so much from a resume perspective, but more a case of, are you doing some kind of background checks? Do you know a little bit about the people that you're employing? Uh, are, are they good guys that are capable? Do they have some... Um, some convictions that you should be aware of. Not that that's necessarily bad, but do you even know? Okay. Uh, similarly, um, when it comes to methodologies, we do have a reasonable idea of what a good methodology looks like. And so through the accreditation process, we can set a set of minimum bars. The objective is not to accredit organisations and go, your methodology is no good. These people over here are no good. Not, not at all. We, we try and coach people through the process and say, okay, that, that web app me methodology you presented, there's some really good bits in there, but you're missing these bits here. Why don't you go away and have a think about how you can evolve it? The driver there is we're trying to drive standards. We're trying to push people forward and over that bar. And we're also trying to help buyers make more informed decisions. So when somebody issues an RFP for some form of technical assurance act, uh, activity, if they're, they're using a Crest company, they know instantly that some of those default questions have been answered. Similarly, we certify organisations. Now, that, how do we do that? We, we run a series of examinations that are aligned to different technology sets. So we do stuff ar around penetration testing, uh, we do stuff that, that's aligned to wireless and to infrastructure and web application. In addition, we do stuff around red teaming. But of course, penetration testing is, is great, but you, you also need to be able to communicate with the client. You need to be able to talk in terms of risk. Yes, you need to be able to find technical vulnerabilities, but you need to be able to take that and communicate in a manner that has some value back to the board. So as part of our examinations, they're the kind of things that we're assessing as well. In addition, if you're gonna go out and do a pen test, do you know whether or not there are any legal or regulatory controls that you need to operate within? So instead of just focusing on the tech, we're going to look at legal, we're going to look at regulatory controls, and we're going to look at your communication skills. And we, we certify organisations uh, from people that have just come out of university, uh, maybe with three or four years of experience, and then five, six, seven, eight years worth of experience. Now, we recognise that in some respects, another certification, does the world really need another certification? Because there are other good certifications out there. And I guess the view is, well, we're looking to partner. So we've already gone out and in 2015 we signed an MOU with Offensive Security because we said, you know what, they've got some really good certs and we should recognise them. We shouldn't get people to go out and do this multiple times. It's a SANS one now, it's an IC squared one now, it's a, a Crest one. You know, if, if there's an opportunity to align and if it helps with that objective of 
professionalization, building capability, capacity, and consistency, that's great. We're not looking to try and make money from this. We are looking to, to as I say, professionalize the industry. In addition to that, we, we run a number of schemes. So that might sound a little bit strange, and I'll come on to that on a later slide, but we, we, we run schemes around vulnerability analysis. We run some schemes around penetration testing. We run some schemes around red teaming and, and, and some other things around what we call STAR, which stands for Simulated Target Attack and Response. Now, the reason why we do that is each of those different schemes have different requirements. So if you're an organization that's red, a red teaming organization, you've got some really, really sophisticated capability, you can go and get credit against that, and you can demonstrate that back in a meaningful manner back to the market. <laughs> Similarly, if actually what you're trying to do is scan, and you, you've built a really cool uh, continuous bank vulnerability scanning offering, uh, and you're looking for, to, to commoditize that, great, you can go and demonstrate that being a, by being accredited against the vulnerability analysis piece. What we provide through those schemes is an opportunity for organizations to differentiate themselves uh, and demonstrate where, they, where they're good and capable. This sounds a, a, a little bit dull, but the way we bind all this together is with something called a code of conduct. Uh, the idea there is that um, all of the members that sign up to this, all of the people that take the exams, all of the, all the organizations that become accredited, they say, you know what, we're doing this because we, we believe in good, okay? And we know what the good, uh, we know what the right answers are. So if we're gonna go out and do a pen test, and accidentally we cause something to fa fail and fall over, we know that our code of conduct says, we're not gonna walk away and pretend it wasn't us. We're gonna go, okay, that was, that was us. Because there's some ethics associated with this, and we think that, that it's a, appropriate that people that are operating in, in an area that is, has some complexity and some risk associated with it can be perceived as having good uh, ethical standing. So the code of conduct ties people into organizations. It also means that as an organization, uh, if you say that you have a methodology that does A followed by B followed by C, and actually you forget about that and don't do any of that, and a buyer then says, hang on a second, that wasn't right, that's not what they did, they went straight to C, well, we can go back and say, hang on, you signed up to this code of conduct, you said that your methodology was true and reflective of, of how you operate. We undertake research in a similar kind of vein to, to, to the way that OWASP does. Our research is a little bit more, uh, as you would expect, focused on around technical assurance and pen testing. Um, the types of research we're doing, is, it's not vulnerability research, it's research on how can we make this better for the industry. The kind of research initiatives we're saying are, how do you go out and buy a pen test? So, that, so they, we do research guides for the buying community. Similarly, we might do research initiatives uh, for buying community that folks around, how can we make pen testing reports more consistent? So if you get a pen test report from vendor A and one from B and one from C, you can look at them and, and derive some kind of commonality or meaning. It doesn't mean that they all need to be the same, it just means that they need to have some consistent elements within those reports. So we do some re research and we offer guidance or, around uh, how we can make that better. And many of the, the, the members that operate internationally absolutely sign up to that and use those those research initiatives. And as I touched on, we, we work very closely with training companies. A, po a point that I didn't touch on is we do certifications, but we don't do training. The view is if you do training, you do certification, then maybe there's a little bit of conflict of interest. So what we do is we set a bar. We don't offer training on tell to tell you how to pass the bar. We set the bar fairly high, uh, and the view is that we leave that to the training companies. They build their syllabuses to align with, with some of the stuff that we're assessing, uh, and the view is that that results in, in a um, less of a co conflict of interest, let's say. <coughs> and as I say, we're highly collaborative. So we're here with OWASP today. I had meetings with EC Council last week and with IC2, or IC Squared. Uh, we have an MOU with, with PTES. We, we're looking to collaborate with industry to help the industry mature and professionalise. So, why does accreditation have value? Um, there's a really interesting piece of work that was done a number of years ago. It was Nobel Prize winning, uh, and, and it was done by a gentleman called George Akerloft. His work was called A Market of Lemons. There's been some parallels that have been drawn between his work and the cybersecurity space. I won't go into all of the detail, but really the, the, the essence of his piece of work is that in many industries there is asymmetry of information between buyers and sellers. If you're a pen testing company, 
you know what good looks like in theory. You know what a good pen testing report looks like. You understand lots of the terminology that we saw on the screen previously. Some of it's very complicated, uh, but you understand it, okay? Quite often the buyers, they don't really understand it. They look at it, they, their eyes glaze over, and they don't know how to make a decision, okay? So we have this asymmetry of information whereby buyers don't really know what they're buying, they know they need to do something, they don't really understand the difference between red teaming, pen testing, vulnerability analysis, or threat assessments, they just know they need to do something, and of course the people that work in the infosec space, they absolutely understand it. So the problem with that is that how do people make decisions? They make decisions based upon price, they go well, I'll take the medium point or the middle point, and that, that, that's how I will decide determine goodness and value. And of course, that isn't necessarily a good indicator. Okay? It doesn't necessarily mean you're capable. It just means that you've got an aggressive pricing policy. So there's recognition from many governments around the world that the lemon market syndrome, if we call it that, absolutely is prevalent within cybersecurity. It's, in, it's prevalent within the US, it's prevalent within the UK, it's prevalent in every market. And so the view is, in some regions, government has said, OK, well, we see this problem. What we need to do is we need to go out and work with industry to try and fix it. That's one of the things that happened in the UK a number of years ago. Uh, the Prime Minister's office in Australia did the same thing. Uh, the Singaporean Monetary Authority and the CSA out in Singapore did the same thing. The Hong, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, they said, we need to improve the bar, we need to set some standards, etc. They didn't necessarily say everybody needs to, to conform to it, but they said... We should have a standard, we'll put the standard there, we will let people decide whether or not they apply and work towards it, or they don't. We will let market forces take over at that point. And I guess what we've seen really in, in, in the US market, and I run a, an organisation that is US based, um, government has taken less of an active role. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying that's where it is. It's been much more left to market forces. So my suggestion is that as a market, as people that operate in this market, potentially there's some things that we can do to try and help define what good looks like. So that's the reason why we think accreditation has some value. Now, I don't think we're alone. So earlier this year, the NSA contacted us and said, we do accreditation. So we do accreditation ourselves, uh, and we have a scheme called a scheme called CIRA. And that scheme goes out and accredits organisations that do incident response services for uh, critical parts of the federal government. And they've run the program for around about two years. Uh, and because they're at the NSA, of course, it makes it a little bit difficult for them to publicise it. They can't talk openly about what it is and how it works, etc. But they're desperate for organisations to sign up to it. Their view is that they want to get more and more organisations accredited through their scheme so that there are more and more organisations that can help some of those national security systems owners respond to sophisticated attacks. So at the beginning of this year, they had around about 15 uh, organisations that had gone through accreditation uh, as part of that CIRA scheme. And they approached Crest and said, we think we should work with industry. We should have that public-private partnership that you often hear about, and we would like you to run that scheme for us. So uh, as of July 2016, uh, Crest has taken over that, and we're working in a collaborative manner with the NSA to try and accredit organisations in the realm of incident response. So hopefully that's an indicator uh, of accreditation and, and why it might be successful. Um, I talked a little bit about certification, uh, drilling in a little bit more detail about that. So, so we do certification uh, at the practitioner level, at the registered level, and at the certified level. And really what we're trying to do here is drive uh, capability into the industry. Ironically, when Crest was formed, it only, only focused at the certified level. The bar was really super high, and that meant that it was really difficult for people to come out of university, progress through the first few years in industry, and then take the examination. So over time, over the last 10 years, we've retrofitted uh, another series of exams beneath that, and then one beneath that as well. And as I say, uh, the exams, they are technical, but equally they talk about regulator controls, legal issues, risk management, communication skills, etc. And we're delivering all of these uh, examinations in, uh, in the US today.
I won't spend the whole, whole load of time on, on this slide because it's quite busy, but this is designed to show some of the career pathways that we've built. So for pen testing, we talk about practitioner and register and certified. What happens is you grow up through the stack uh, at certified, you can move into things like web application, you can move into infrastructure, you can move into mobile, you can move into wireless, etc. But the idea is that there is career progression uh, throughout. And I touched on this earlier. So the code of conduct is the thing that, that binds the accreditation piece and the certification elements together. I'm going to talk a little bit about this here because... Um, I think it has some relevance. It wasn't going to be a core part of the presentation initially, but I want to share some thoughts around vulnerability analysis and pen testing and red teaming, and certainly give you Crest's view of how they all fit together. So I think in markets where there is no form of yardstick to measure good and capable organisations, we often find that these kind of words, vulnerability analysis, pen testing, red teaming, etc., they get used interchangeably. I sat in a uh, presentation earlier this year down in DC and there was an industry expert that was talking about red teaming uh, and he was red teaming his cars. And I kind of thought to myself, yeah, red, red teaming clearly is, is a concept, it's great, but I'm not sure red teaming necessarily fits in my mind with what you do with a car. Now, I work within this information security industry, he works within the information security industry. I'm not saying I'm right and he's wrong. What I'm saying is, if we can't agree on what red teaming is and how it would work, then how can we expect a buyer to understand what red teaming is and what, they, what, what they're going to derive uh, from having a red teaming test? So we have these different schemes that try and help differentiate some of those. And uh, I'll run through some of those uh, now. So vulnerability analysis, as, as you would expect, is going to be going out and looking for commodity-based issues. When you talk about infrastructure, you talk about uh, internet of things, or, yes. or yeah. only a specific, or specific industry, you got like some, some set of infrastructure. No, so we, we do uh, stuff that is generic, uh, based upon uh, every type of product set, so internet of things, uh, cloud-based stuff, infrastructure application mobile so, so we do that as generic and we also run some schemes that are aligned to specific industry verticals so we have some that are specific for financial services because some of their challenges specifically some of their threats are different different to uh telecoms which might be different to retail and the view is if you're going to do assurance uh, for different industry verticals it's probably sensible to tailor your assurance program according to the different threats that those industries see so we, we our programs both do some of the generic, but they also align to different industry verticals as well. So what I was saying with the, the with vulnerability analysis is, um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted, it's, it's in essence, it's finding vulnerabilities. It's not about exploiting vulnerabilities. There's often, often high degrees of automation that can be built into it, and it clearly has huge amounts of value to organisations. But when you step up from that to a penetration test, I guess a pen test is designed to perform some form of exploitation. And if you think about how traditional um, penetration tests have been done, they have normally been done based against a defined scope. So ordinarily, you might go and say, I want you to do a pen test against that site, London. I want you to do a pen site test against that site there, Boston. Or alternatively, I've coded a new web application. I want you to do a defined scope assessment against this new web app. That clearly has a whole load of value, but it's all based around defined scope, you know, defined parameters, things that you're not supposed to move outside of. And I guess that has more value than delivering vulnerability analysis, but clearly the bad guys don't have defined scopes. Um, they won't necessarily look at a mobile app and say, well, I'm just going to look at that in isolation. They'll look at how that interface is uh, with some... Other apps, some infrastructure, possibly some people, possibly some su su supply chain. And unless you're looking at some of those things as well, then maybe your pen test isn't quite giving you the level of assurance that you, you might have looked or you might like to have. So the step up from a defined scope pen test is, is one of a, an objective fo focused pen test. So a good example might be if you're a financial services organization, you might say, okay, actually, really what we care about is. We've read all about all this stuff that's going on in, in Bangladesh with the SWIFT payment network. And re what we're really concerned about is, could someone do that to me? Could someone stop some kind of transactions either flowing or manipulate them so I lose a whole lot of money? Or alternatively, could somebody somehow get a cheque issued for a, a, a you know, seven-figure amount of money? If you could do that, I'd be really concerned. 
I'm much more concerned about an, a, you achieving an objective than I am about something that I don't really understand, like SQL injection or command in, in, injection. So an objective focus assessment is, as, as I've described, here is the objective. Uh, I, I've heard of a, a test recently where an organisation an organization said, I want you to see whether or not you can issue a cheque for a certain figure amount of money. I don't mind how you do it. You can do it externally, you can do it internally. I just want to understand whether or not some of my controls in place would prevent that. So you can compromise or you can try and find vulnerabilities in people, process, or technology, whatever you like. And I guess what that means is you end up with some blended forms of assessment that covers all of those different areas, the people, the process, and the technology. We then think that there are some additional stages beyond that, and that's what STAR and CBEST has, has tried to deliver uh, over, over the last two years. So STAR is really based upon, instead of in that scenario where I talked about uh, having an objective that you try and uh, deliver assurance against, it's more about what are the bad guys really doing? So if you're financial services, what are the threat actors actually doing today? What did they do to similar types of organisations to you last week, the week before, the week before that? From a tech perspective, what kind of things did they target? From a people, pro people and process perspective, what were they looking at? Was it the supply chain? Were they harvesting stuff within social media? Were they building a watering hole attack? Or was it spear phishing? When they were doing that, how were they creating an implant or, 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 a, or a payload? Was it done through some form of PDF or was it a macro-enabled Excel document? What was it? The idea with STAR is that you kind of go, take a step back. Instead of jumping straight in and doing a pen test, let's understand what the intelligence says. If we understand what the threat actors are doing, specific to my industry or my organisation or other people that are similar to myself, let's build up some scenarios based upon that and deliver assurance to the organisations. Uh, along those kind of, kind, of, kind of storyboards. And then the last piece, um, which I, I won't dwell on a lot, is very much industry specific. This is a piece of work that the, the Bank of England did in the UK uh, two years ago. There have been recent ones uh, in the Netherlands and as I say in Singapore and Malaysia and, and Hong Kong. Uh, financial regulators there are building similar programs. But again, the idea here is that this is a threat-led red teaming exercise against systemically important financial institutions whereby it's simulating real known attack uh, TTPs and in addition instead of just saying it's going to go out and look at uh, test and dev environments it's looking at real live environments that's one of the key things we see this is that if you're going to go out and do pen testing don't focus just on the stuff that is in the test lab Focus on the real stuff. And of course that has some risks, definitely. Okay? But what you need to do is, uh, through some of the accreditation and certification process, have confidence as a buyer that the person who you're working with can manage that risk effectively. So the scenario might be that if, if as part of your scenario, you're trying to sim simulate an adversary that you think is gonna go out and modify some source code, and that source code's on a mid-range or mainframe system, and it's uh, operated by specific types of people, that might be your scenario, and you might follow a number of different steps from outside into the environment to try and understand whether or not that might be possible, of course, without actually modifying the source code. Could you get to the source code? Tick. Could you find somebody that had access to the live system? Tick. Could you find a way that you could, in theory, uh, update the source code? Tick. If you could do that, it's plausible. So Crest has, has been running schemes like that for governments, for regulators, etc., for a number of years. I'll try and uh, bring the presentation uh, to an end because I know that Tom's got some uh, ideas around making it a little bit more interactive. So these are some of the thought leadership pieces we do. So we've got procurement guys, we've got uh, guys around incident response, around uh, security operations centres, around pen testing. We've got some stuff that is all about getting younger people into the industry, about um, getting more women into, into cyber as well, so the, the, the gender challenge that we often see ourselves faced with. To sum up, so we're here to support buyers, we're here to support suppliers, we're here to support 
organizations that deliver technical assurance services. We're here to su support all of those entities here. We're here to support cybersecurity professionals. What we are trying to help the industry do is professionalize. We are here in New York. We do have some background. We have, as I say, we have uh, 80 odd members uh, internationally, 10 of which are, are based specifically in New York, and, and many of those are very international, the KPMGs, PWCs, et cetera, of the world. Um, and I guess at that point, I'll hand it open to, to questions. So we do, have, we do have a mic. If you're interested in asking some questions, I'd like to pass it around. But I, I guess I'd like to start off by uh, asking some pointed questions of just by show of hands. How many people here is your first OWASP meeting? All right, so the majority of you have been there before. How many of you folks are active penetration testers, security people doing a, a service for an organization to other companies? Show of hands. Okay, one. How many folks two? two. How many folks in here actually consume services like penetration testing, code review, things of that nature? Okay, great. So there's a little bit of a balance, right? So my question becomes, uh, you know, from a small side, a niche player, versus a large side, organizations that might have, you know, a thousand or more pen tests with people in that space, um, there's different perspectives. So I'm very interested in hearing, you know, what you guys think about this as it rolls into the, the states. And if you've actually experienced it perhaps from the industry side, some of the industry folks, have you, have you experienced this if your companies are global? Have you experienced this already using Crest as an example in the UK? I want to talk a little bit about that. Have you seen that at all? Anyone? Tony, have you seen it come across your plate? I mean, uh, with some of the financial exchanges that are international, we have clients that reference press a lot. And, but, you know, it, it, it unfortunately hasn't gone down. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, we've seen a lot in the UK, uh, especially for uh, like investment um, financial uh, broke, uh, exchanges. Um, so they, they reference Crest a lot in terms of what kind of like a, a standard for for certain types of uh, pen testing rigor. So. so so one thing I should add that I, I missed out is so we we have a model that's again quite similar on OWASP, uncannily similar to OWASP, in the sense that we have chapters uh, and we have people that have responsibility for those chapters. Uh, Maybe the slight difference is we, we then have something called an executive, so the people that effectively run the individual chapters. Now, um, as you rightly say, Chris started off in the UK, but when we start a chapter in, in Australia, it's not run by people in the UK. Similarly, when the chapters were started in Singapore and in Hong Kong, they're run by local people. The chapter that, that is uh, run in, in New York will be run by local people, local organizations that kind of go, I buy into this, I can see the need. I can see why it would be good to run, uh, or to be involved in helping the industry professionalize. And so as a result, we're looking for people that are passionate about this, that, that want to be involved. So it isn't gonna be a case of, you know, this is a standard that was a UK standard, and here we are, have a bit of that. None of that whatsoever. It's a case of, we've worked out some things in the UK that kind of work for us, but the reality is, what works for you? If there's some elements that, that can work in New York, wonderful. If there are some different elements that we need to adjust to work in on the West Coast, that's no problem either. If we need to adjust the requirements for financial services in New York because they're different to London, well, that's no problem either. What we want to try and do, though, is have a common thread that, throw, that flows amongst all of them where there is some kind of commonality. Because the worst case scenario is whereby you have a standards or compliance framework that in New York says do this. And if you're a big financial institution, you, you go off and, and deliver against that. And then it's a different one in Singapore. And then it's a different one in London. And then it's a different one in Frankfurt. Because it's, it just doesn't work. There has to be some kind of commonality. Excellent. Question? Anyone else over here? When you say about background check, do you mean also protecting corporate espionage? Things like that? So we don't necessarily say what's a good background check or a bad background check. We just say you should do one, okay? So it would be sensible that if you're gonna be employing a team of people, they're gonna be going out and looking at really sensitive information for an organization, you're getting under the hood and looking at stuff that they definitely don't wanna have disclosed, that you understand the people you're employing. So we don't say what the bar is. Um, we just say you need to do something. 
So, it, you know, that, that could be some form of clear clearance, that could be financial checks, it could be a whole raft of other things. You've just got to do something. You've got to have a process that defines how you do it consistently. Are there certain vertical markets that uh, are most uh, interested in, in this certification? So we've seen huge amounts of interest in financial services, in truth, I guess because uh, historically they as a market probably have led the way when it comes to technical, technical assurance. Um, we see initiatives that are being run by, uh, say, major financial regulators in Asia, in Europe, uh, and there are certainly conversations out in the US as well. So financial services definitely uh, work fairly closely with CREST. Um, we have also, as you would imagine, we work very closely with, with government, federal government, local government, etc. Uh, we have initiatives that are operating uh, internationally, specifically in telecoms. Quite often what will happen is a, an organisation or a government agency or a regulator will say, I've got a problem, okay? So some of the people that operate in my space they're all being attacked in a similar kind of way. And you know what, we've got some intelligence uh, and we, we can see it, we know what's happening, but they're just not doing assurance in a way that's good enough. And so what will happen is there will be some kind of external force that will say, okay, can you help us define a program that meets our specific needs? So uh, we, we're just in the throes of doing one specifically uh, around telecoms in, in Europe because there was a specific requirement you, some of you might have seen a, a bridge in the UK uh, where many, many hundreds of thousands worth, well, millions worth of uh, credentials were stolen from an organisation called Talk Talk. So I think that was the catalyst where the, uh, the telecom, telecommunications regulator said, we need to do something different. Cool. All right, well, there's, is there any more questions? Great. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.